It's always good to be back in the house of the Lord, to be together, just to sit at his feet and see what he has for us. Just a blessing to see everybody's smiling face. Um, uh, this morning, uh, the word that, that I'd like to share with you that I feel God has for us uh, kind of began on Thursday night. Um, we had uh, Thursday night prayer uh, this week. Um, that's truly as a as a as a reminder or a, a commercial, if you will, um, that was put in place to help out those who say, oh, "I work on Saturdays; it's rough. Oh, I've got this or that on Saturdays; and it's really hard to get to prayer at certain times." Um, so we do once a month on Thursday night. We haven't seen the faces change yet, but we know that God's doing a work. So we want to step out and support because that's, uh, as uh, Pastor Ray used to always say, that prayer is the engine room of the church. And we always want to be together and uh, be able to lift up the needs of one another. When you have a need, you want the brethren coming together. We'll text each other. We'll call each other. Please pray. Please pray. And we have that opportunity to be together and pray. So take advantage of it. Get the commercial just in. <laughs> Praise God. But we read in 2 Timothy. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy. Uh, chapter 3. And we see this is a letter from Paul to, to Timothy. And the title I gave this message was uh, Trust in Troubled Times. says 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll start in verse 1. It says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captive, uh, captives of gullible women, Loading down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Praise God. That's, that's some powerful scriptures. Talking about the last days. Brutal. Without self-control. It says, from such turn away, because they're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Always want something new. Always looking for some new thing that's going to bring them the answer that they're looking for. But never coming to the truth. Let's bow our heads and pray. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather in your name. We thank you for allowing us to be together, Lord. My heart is truly encouraged this morning. But faces of your people, and we ask that you would bless them in a special way. Father, strengthen them, guide them, and just move by your Holy Spirit through your word. Father, minister to your people in a special way this morning, Lord. Father, they come hungry and they need a touch from you. Bless them in a special way. We continue to touch those who are at home in the same likeness. Father, those who are afflicted, Lord, you know, each one in each circumstance, we lift up our sister Vicki to you. Father, I ask you to continue to strengthen and heal her, Lord. Even uh, my brother Ted and his wife Cynthia, as you know, all they're going through. And Father, many others that you know each by name and all that stand before them. We place them in your hands, Lord. Bless them and strengthen them. We put this meeting in your hand, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God. So... 
I think it's pretty self-explanatory the day that we live in. When we read these scriptures, I mean, how many times have we read these words and thought, wow, that's really a tough time. It's really going to be a scary situation. It's really going to be a really bad situation when people become lovers of self above all else. And today in the world we live in, that's, that's, that's preeminent above all things. That's, self is the, the most worshipped God in the world. The God of self. It's easy to find. Just look in the mirror. And whatever you give to that God is a blessing because you get to receive it. And that's kind of the way the world looks at things. But when we see some of these other things, we see things that I truly believe we haven't seen so much of in the past. I should say in the amount. Man has always been brutal. Sin has always been sin and deadly. But in the days we live in, it just seems things are going to a, a, a new low. We don't want to glorify the enemy. We don't want to stand and and uh, and preach that the enemy is gaining any ground or doing anything in the positive. But we have to look at our circumstances and understand as we read the Word of God and we look at the day that we live in, we have to see some of the comparisons that are happening. Um, on Tuesday here in Orange County, I think it was Stanton. The, 76 year old man was getting beaten by four or five guys and a 49 year old pizza delivery guy doing his job trying to provide for his family 49 years old delivering pizzas he's hustling he's trying to provide for his family sees this man being beaten and tries to stop what's going on and he's shot and killed they even shot the 76 year old man but praise god he, he survived but that is the evil heart not a concern for human life. Their only thought was what they were going to get from this older gentleman and what they could be blessed with. And nothing was going to get in the way of that. That's what we're reading right now. On Monday in San Antonio, Texas, they found a truck. They heard a scream from a business close by for help. And they called the authorities and they opened the doors of these trucks and there was 48 people that had passed. The coroner said there was a total of 53 bodies that were, that were taken from this truck. Some of them young people. People trying to get across the border to have a better life. The Homeland Security statement said that in the past, this job of smuggling was more of a mom and pop industry. Not that these were good people and it's changed, but it was on a smaller scale where they actually showed maybe some concern for the people. Now it has been taken over by the cartel, which are shipping cattle basically and can care less if they lose a load a truckload of cattle when you're talking about the lives of 53 human beings. The love of money. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. We see this in the day that we live in. How can we look at that and not see it in the scripture? How can we see this in our, and we can see this on the news, oh, I don't want to see that, and we change it. Yeah, I agree, I don't need it, I change it all the time. But we have to understand what's going on. We have to understand how dark the days are getting, so we can stop thinking, everything is just fine. It's great, we're here, it's Sunday morning, we're rejoicing, we just worship God. Don't, don't bring us down. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't want to, we don't want to hear about bad stuff, we want to continue to, to just rejoice. Obviously, we love the Lord, and we know God is in control, but we have to see 
see our circumstance, that there is much for us to do. If we don't feel that there's a need, then why would we be compelled to do anything? We want to stand in the gap for those who need us. And that's including your family members whom you love. That's including your brother and sister next to you. Just the fact that you're here on a Sunday morning is blessing your brother and your sister right next to you. And some of those brothers and sisters that are next to you are here on Wednesday night when you're not here and could use that blessing and that strength. Because we need to remember the darkness of the day. If we think we can just serve God passingly, we can't do these things. God hasn't called us to do that in the day we live in. But we want to look at a man who was in a circumstance where he was just overwhelmed. Things were just piling up to the point where he's ready to give up. And that's King David. So I'm going to ask you to, to move to Psalms 55. You can leave a, a marker in 2 Timothy. We'll, we'll be back at the end here shortly. But in Psalms 55... We see David truly suffering, but we see his suffering in three stages or three phases. <clears throat> David goes through the first stage, which is verses 1 through 7, which is help me, I'm drowning. I don't think there can be a more... Crucial, or what's the word I'm looking for? I guess, help me, I'm on fire. That might be <laughs> that might be a little bit worse. But somebody put me out, and I'm on fire. Yeah, that's really a necessary, a real, a real need involved there. Drowning, I see it just about the same, because it's life, life or death. So his first portion is help me, I'm drowning. The second portion is verses 8 through 15 is make them pay. And the third portion is verses 16 through 23, which is as for me, what I'm going to do. So Psalms 55, we'll start in verse 1. We'll read the first seven verses. The word of God says in verse 1, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint, and I moan noisily because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked. For they bring down trouble upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is severely pained within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. I don't think you could use words to share a darker place that you could be in than what David is using. He's saying, everything is coming against me. And many think this is the time when his son Absalom was trying to take his life. But he says, give ear to my prayer, O God. Do not hide your, your supplications. Don't, don't hide from me. He felt, David felt like God was far away. Sometimes in the midst of trials, we can feel like God is far away. Sometimes in the midst of trials, it's us that's far away. And we have to turn back to God. We get caught up in a circumstance or a situation. and You know how the, how the enemy works. You just, you just miss by a little bit. You just slack just a little bit before you know it. And you blink. You know, How did I end up in the middle of this mess? What can 
I do make things right in this? And you can't do it from that spot. We gotta turn, we gotta run back to the foot of the cross. We gotta bring things back to, to God. And David is feeling like God can't hear him. He's feeling like all he's going through, that he's gonna lose his life. He thinks he's gonna die. And he gives us the reasoning why. He said, because the voice of my enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, all these things are coming against me. He says, I am rest, I am restless in my complaint, and I moan noisily. You know when someone is in pain, that you can't stop your body from making noise? When you're suffering in a manner of pain, it just, it just comes out. You can't hold it in. Sometimes it's just even pain of a broken heart. Sometimes it's a physical pain that you're just trying to get relief and just in moaning and pushing that button, the, calling the nurse, Regis, hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> I need pain meds. <laughs> but these things are audible sounds that come from what we're going through. And David is sharing this picture exactly of how he's feeling. My heart is severely pained within me. He says, I'm overwhelmed. Have we ever been overwhelmed? Are we overwhelmed this morning? It's very easy to become overwhelmed in all that we go through in this life. But what was David's answer? In verse 6, it says, So I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. His desire, we can see it as beautiful because we think of the dove and the Holy Spirit. We think of a dove is not like an eagle. Like an eagle will fly high and it'll go, it'll soar high and it'll be a predator and it'll look for it. A dove will fly low and look for the closest place of refuge. So he just wants to get out. He just wants to be free of what's going on. He said, if I had wings like a dove, I would fly and I would rest. Sometimes that's what we need. But if that's our desire, we have to be careful. Because David gives a warning. This isn't where the psalm ends. Um, it also says in verse 7, Indeed, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness. Selah, meaning stop and think about that. Our lives are so busy and hectic. Imagine just being out in the wilderness and the calm, not a care or a concern in the world, just to be still. And that's what he was desiring. But we as believers, we can't just desire what is our will. We can't just desire what will be best for us in our circumstance, as David was doing here. He was thinking of all these things that would be tremendous for his relief. Um, David Wilkerson shared about a... Uh, trying to think of the word that they used. It was a, like a survey or a study that was done on crabs. And it made me curious to look into it. And I want to show a slide of crab number one. That is a big ugly crab. That is called the Japanese spider crab. That crab can be 10 to 12 feet across. The body can be 18 to 20 inches wide. With that big, ugly, hard shell. 
That has absolutely nothing to do with the message this morning, but I thought it was really amazing. Go to the next slide. <laughs> this is the guy we're looking for, the hermit crab. This is a, a little, this is the opposite end of the spectrum. This is a little crab that makes his life from going in the shell of other animals. This is, uh, I'm trying to think of his name from under the sea. Sebastian. All right, we have some good Disney fans here. Um, he had like a tomato can or something that he was wearing at some point. But that's what he would do, or he, that's what they do. They survive by retreat. And, uh, yeah, we can go ahead and, I was going to say put the other one back, but we don't need to. Um, the point that this study was showing was the fact that a, I don't want to say average or normal, but a sea crab lives in rocky, in rocky, in a rocky area with the waves pounding it, with so many different predators coming against it. So this crab has to fight for its life on a constant basis. The hermit crab doesn't do that. He hides. He says, I don't have to worry about getting a shell. I have to go find somewhere to hide. And he hides. This other crab who's battling is growing stronger. It says the legs of this crab begin to grow strong. The shell begins to harden from the abuse, from the things that it's gone through, from the beating of the waves, from the other predators trying to get to it. Learning how to maneuver on the rocks to be able to get away from the other predators makes him more able to handle the next situation that comes along. And this crab is ready to survive and do well. And it says that the hermit crab, from always being self-concerned, will start to wither away to where their, their even members start to corrode and fall off their arms or their features, whatever you want to call it. My, my bio, I was never that great in biology class or science class. <laughs> but they are only able to get to the point where they just exist. Just existing. Hoping that today's not the day they get washed out of their shell. That is empty. That is truly survival. God didn't call his people to survive. He called us to go forward and to strive and, 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 and shine for him and be used as tools in his hand. And seeing the difference in that picture makes us think, what does God have for us? How can he use us in the things that we go through? In our daily lives, we go through a lot of things. And sometimes we just say, we can't take it anymore. But God is using it to strengthen us. To give us the ability to pour into others. And if all we're doing is being the hermit crab, then we're just sitting back and going through all these things and not allowing God to gain any victory in it. And you know what? The most important the, the most beneficial part of that is within us. It is that relationship with God that we have and the blessing that we receive in being used as tools in his hand, as instruments in his hand, it brings us tremendous joy. When we see God can use anything we go through. I mean, no, no matter how small, no matter how big. You know, and it's not a matter of, 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 of self-glorification, everything points to the Lord. Everything that we do points to God. We can do nothing without Him. So we, we go to the second part, where David says, make them pay. Verse 8. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues. For I have seen violence and strife in the city. 
Day and night they go around it on its walls. Iniquity and trouble are also in the midst of it. Destruction is in its midst. Oppression and deceit do not depart from, the, from its streets. See, this is a, this is a, a, almost so much of what we just talked about in those two news stories. Just the enemy running wild in the streets. I, I, I know we kind of had a, a, a little bit of a, of a uh, focus group, if you will, before prayer, and we were all kind of talking a little bit about the things that are going on today and some of the things that, that we see in the world and how we see people just walking into stores with bags, just loading them up, employees standing there watching with their camera. You guys going to pay for that? No? They just walk out. Nobody says anything. No charges are brought. Because if they are charged, they just are let go because it's not a high enough dollar amount because they've changed so many ways. Let me get off my soapbox now. But the fact is, so many of the things that we're seeing is just people of their own doing what's right in their own eyes. These are warnings of the scriptures. Throughout the Old Testament, they did what was right in their own eyes. This was like a cry from, from, uh, from Israel as they kept stumbling and falling and doing what was right in their own eyes. That's, that's, the, that's the cry of the day. Doing what you think is right in their own eyes. And this is what was going on. And all of this evil was going on. Verse 12. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me. Then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. Let death seize them. Let them go down alive into hell. For wickedness is their dwelling and among them. Wickedness is in their dwelling and among them. See, David is making references mostly to, to uh, like I mentioned before, his son Absalom and uh, Ahithophel. Ahithophel was David's right-hand man, if you will. Somebody that he took counsel with. Somebody that stood with him as he was king. And as his son Absalom kind of became a little tricky and went his own way and said, uh, I'll be back and gathered an army and decided he was going to take this throne from his dad and, and kill his father. This is the references that David is making. He said, if it was my enemy, I could take it, but this was someone that knew me. How much more damage can be done from within than can be done from the outside? It's like that in family. It's like that in church. Somebody tries to come against the, the house of God. We're going to see a bunch of people stand up in here ready to... We've been seeing some pretty scary things on the news in different situations and circumstances, but I feel sorry for the person who tries to come in this place. Brother Ruben's sitting back here in the back ready to take him, ready to take him out. He's got that cane ready to whack him a good one. But David is making this reference, and then even at the end it talks about David mentions about them going down alive into hell, like the sons of Korah. Or like Korah, I should say. <laughs> um, but when David is saying these things, he's saying it because he was crushed by it. He's saying what he has gone through, and because it was an attack from within, he felt it came from the inside. Because 
Those you love, you respect. Their words are the ones that can hurt you. Who is the one that knows you the best? I don't want to start any problems here, <laughs> especially for myself. But my wife just like, oh. But who can push your buttons like anyone else? Like, like no one else, I should say. Because they know you the best. Who can say that one word that they know, phew, it's going to really. <laughs> Not that we would ever do that, husbands or men. But we, because we, we know each other so well, our spouses can say something. If your spouse tells you something that, you're going to wear that. My wife didn't say that. You're going to wear that, and you go, Shh. and all of a sudden, now you're self-conscious, and you're like, that doesn't even but now I feel uncomfortable, and you know, somebody else would have told you that, oh, you're wearing that, yeah, so, <laughs> you don't care their opinion, it doesn't mean anything to you, <laughs> yeah, you should see the hat that goes with this, you know, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't bother you in the slightest, you can, you can be silly or offend them, or should, you're going to say that when you're wearing that, I mean, <laughs> but the fact that somebody has your heart like that is when they affect us. And in the same likeness in our families, in, in, in our homes, in, in the church, we have to be mindful even more so of one another, of showing that love to one another. But the part here that I really want to bring up, and I don't, and I'm not saying this to us, church, that this is our situation, our circumstance. I'm saying what the Word of God is saying. What David is saying. David's circumstance. What had David done before this? He's saying, how could somebody close to me come against me in this way? They should go to hell uh, alive into hell and be consumed. And somebody under their breath might have went, <coughs> Bathsheba. <coughs> You're right, the Hittite. <coughs> What about what happened when he fell with Bathsheba? And he had his leading general sent into battle, and then the troops backed away and left him out to die in battle. This had already gone on. This is after that. I, I would hope that none of us have sent anyone into battle to die here. Uh, and, and backed away and left them alone. But I'm saying, when we have circumstances, we have to look both directions. We can't always say, God, let take them down, let them burn uh, alive in hell and the ground open up and swallow them for what they're doing to me and not ever look back at what we've done to anyone else or what we are currently doing to anyone else. We must be mindful in those situations. And I believe this, this scripture that David has given us in, in this psalm is showing very clearly that we must examine our own hearts before we start to judge others. Before we start to make that quick decision about, get them, God. <laughs> get them. That's our first reaction. Get them, God. Thank God he doesn't listen to our first cries. I, I, I can't remember who said it, uh, but it was... Uh, I heard someone say, uh, I think it might have been uh, Chuck Smith's wife, uh, who said she remembered as a child she wanted wings and she was so angry with God that she prayed and she didn't get wings. <laughs> she said, but when she got older, she felt like, good thing I didn't get wings, it would surely be hard to, to get dressed and <laughs> have, have outfits and go to school with my wings on. <laughs> we don't know exactly at certain times what we need, so we need to seek God's face in those areas. And we need to have truly compassion. And that's this is the second portion is, is his anger. But now we get to part three, which is the as for me. Verse 16. As for me, I will call upon God. And the Lord shall save me. Yes. Praise God. Yes. How did this psalm start? 
Give your, hear me, don't hide from me, Lord. Thinking he was so distant and so far, but how is he finishing the song? As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. See, there's not a worry anymore. There's not a concern if God is there, if God can hear him or not. He's, he's stating a fact. It's not a feeling. He's not saying, I, I, now I feel like God will hear. He's stating a fact of who God is and knowing that God will hear. It was emotion that was coming from his heart as he was suffering. And now he's standing saying, as for me, this is what I'm going to do. Verse 18, he has redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. You notice it's, it's, it's was. It was against me. For there were many against me. God will hear and afflict them. So he who abides, even he who abides from old. And then it gives Selah again to think about that. That God is going to do these things. And we can believe in him. Because they do not change, therefore they do not fear God. Verse 20. He has put forth his hand against those who were at peace with who who were at peace with him. He has broken his he has broken his covenant. Verse 21. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was on his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. And verse 23, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Praise God. See how David went from, you can hear my moaning and my pain in all that I'm going through. God, you've abandoned me. Don't you hear me? And as he cried out to God in this song, as he prayed and was seeking God's face, God's comfort came to him. And now he's giving instruction. Now he's telling us what to do in the midst of that situation. He went from that extreme pain to telling us, cast your burdens on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O oh God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. Praise God. He calls us to trust in him. He calls us to trust in him. We can't stay in position number one. God, help me. God, I'm moaning. God, I'm in pain. God, I'm suffering. Help me. From that, our natural response can go to anger. But we have to be able to surrender these things and continue. And David showing, even as he surrendered these things to God, he showed us to look to our own heart. Showed us to examine our heart. And he said, that's for me. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to put all things in your hands. But I will trust in you. Praise God. That's his advice to us. Trust in him. Bring things to him and believe it. I can look at this song and with a very, and be very assured that when he started to write this song, From verse 1 to verse 23, he sat and he wrote the song. Nothing had changed from verse 1 to 23 to his eye, but to his heart, much had changed. He was a different man when he rose up in writing that song. Just like we can be in the same likeness when we rise up from praying, from seeking God's face, from asking Him to intercede. Laying those things down, the burden, laying our burden down at the foot of the cross. Let's go back where we started in, in Second Timothy.
In 2 Timothy, we read some pretty painful <coughs> scriptures regarding the last days and the perilous times that will come. <coughs> but Timothy is receiving these words from Paul. And we know that Timothy, being a godly man, Paul shares with him these things that are going to happen. But in verse 10 he says, but you. And that's us as believers. All these things are going to go on in the midst of this world. But as believers, as those who trust in Jesus Christ, but you, verse 10, have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, my faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions and afflictions which happened to me in Antioch, at Iconium, and at, Ly at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Praise God. Praise God. Paul, Paul, is, a, Paul is a tremendous example to us. I mean, when you can look at a circumstance that somebody that was the most feared and, and how God can change a life, we say, oh, God can't change that person. No, you don't know my God. You should, you know, you hear a lot more from wives. Hey, hey, you don't know my husband. <laughs> my husband, my husband, well, he's, he's always been that way. He's not going to change. And then you look at the life of Paul, who was dragging Christians having them killed and how God used him so mightily. It, it's just it's just amazing. It says he delivered me out of them all. Paul was beaten to the point of death. Beaten to the point of death. It's a, everyone gathered around him on the floor and thought he was dead. To me it's like a like a movie. Just maybe a <clears throat> something. Oh, he's alive. Paul gets up. Let's go back into town. The town they had just beaten. Let's go back in and share the truth of the gospel. He wasn't concerned. Well, what if they, this time they finished the job? He said he had work to do. That was Paul. And Paul said, he had delivered me. Verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. But evil men, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. See, he's telling them about his grandmother and his mother who raised him up in the things of the Lord. He's saying, you have truth. You must continue in the things you've learned. God's people, we must continue in the things we've learned. We can't be distracted by anything. We can't look to the left or to the right. We can't look at these days and sit back in awe and become that hermit crowd. I just want to stay out of the way. As long as nothing happens to me. No, we need to be in the fight. We need to be used by God. And we see how much, even as Paul makes the reference to his mother and his grandmother, how much input do we have in our children and our grandchildren? It is so beautiful. And, 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 I, and I pray that this comes out in the right light. Because I don't want it to sound in any way negative, and I don't want it to sound in any way like I'm trying to pick anybody up. But to me, honestly, it is tremendously beautiful when I see a grandparent bring their grandchild. Because you know what that is saying? That's telling God, okay, maybe my kids aren't in a place where they should be, and God, you do a work, but I'm going to step in. And I'm going to step in the gap, and I'm going to bring them. And when you see them come, man, those kids are rejoicing. 
They love to be here. And when we see that, we rejoice in it. Obviously, we love it when we see a whole family come. I mean, that's great. That's what, that's our desire to see God move in families. That's kind of the, the, uh, the desire that we have had as a church from day one. We've been a family-oriented church. Some churches are set up in different ways. Maybe where they, they reach out to those who are, who are they're, they're going through you know, uh, additions or different things like that. But we've always been a family-oriented church and, and, and with children. And we desire even God to continue to do that. And even with this Vacation Bible School, we have so many that are stepping out to be used and to be a part of supporting it. That's beautiful. That's tremendous. God's going to honor that. But we have to see, see those things and just continue to press into them. Let's continue. And we'll start back in verse 15. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which were able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in, in Christ Jesus. Verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Praise God. Praise God. We have it all at our access. We can be prepared and ready to be used. And it's all been given to us. We just need to go forward in it. And realize it, it truly is a calling that we've been given as believers. There's no such thing as a hermit craft Christian. They don't exist. That's like uh, uh, when someone would say, well, you know, I'm not in full-time ministry. It's we're all in full-time ministry. Every single one. If we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that's full-time ministry. That's how we're supposed to be used. We can't take our our Christian hat off. And I used to I used to play basketball with some guys at work many years ago. <laughs> now football, brother, ready to go basketball. And I would go and play with these guys, and there was one certain guy who was a believer really great guy. But you got him on the basketball court, he's going to punish you. <laughs> Probably still have prints on my chest from his elbow. Jeez, <laughs> man, we're out here just having a good time. And I said, come on, man. I said, I, I looked over at the bench. I go, yeah, I see you, you set your Christianity down over there on that bench. I said, come on, you're going to play basketball. <laughs> you got to carry that thing with you. It's not a backpack. You can't get rid of it. <laughs> we have and then I say all that silliness just to say we have to remember to shine in all circumstances, in all situations. We have to remember to shine and remember the call that we've been given. Um, the last thing I want to share before I call the musicians forward. Um, I was blessed uh, to have, uh, have sat in the classroom of a teacher that really was a tremendous man of God. I, I met him um, in 2014 uh, when I first started going to the Bible College. And uh, this, this brother was really probably one of the most knowledgeable uh, persons of the, of the Word of God that I've, that I've ever met that could just go through the scriptures forward and backward and knew every every side note and I mean just there's some people that just you scratch your head and go man I wish I had half that guy's brain you know <laughs> I would be so excited just to have a portion of that and um, he went home to be with the Lord and uh, they had uh, his services here on Friday uh, at uh, Calvary Chapel Golden Springs and uh, his name was Jesse Barella and really a, a, a beautiful man and we went to, uh, uh, me and my daughter went to the, to the service because we both had him in a few different classes. And um, I have never been so encouraged, uh, not just in God, but encouraged to go out and serve God than what I saw in his life that I didn't really know about. 
and, and on how he was being used in so many different areas. And uh, his sister, his sister got up and shared, uh, and she shared about the last time she spoke with him. And she said he, he grabbed her arm and he told her, please tell the people, please tell the people, Jesus is coming soon. And her comment was, do you have inside information? <laughs> Did God tell you something? She said she got nervous when he said that. She was like, wait, you know. He said, he said, no, we know he's coming soon. Make sure the people are ready. And in his words, he was being told by so many others, it's not your time, and, and, and you still got so much to do. And, and he said, no, I've run my race. But now you have to step up. You have to fill the void. You have to go forward and call others to the knowledge of Christ. And just in hearing that really, really moved my heart to be a servant because he was a servant of servants. And that's what a leader is. The leaders that are here around about you, they're servants of servants because they're serving each other as they serve you. And God is using them to minister to me in a mighty way, to each other in a mighty way, and to you as well. Our, our first call in ministry is the body of Christ. Everything else is secondary. His brother actually stood up and shared, uh, and I want to read this poem to you. He shared, and I'm, and I'm sure many of you may know this, but it's a, a simple saying, kind of like one of those uh, on a pillow, stitched on a pillow type sayings. And the, the, the poem is called Only One Life. It says, two little lines I heard one day traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind it would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in my day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life till soon, till soon be passed. When Satan would a victory, uh, no, you know what, I just skipped a page. I said, that doesn't make sense. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice. Biting me selfless, selfless aim to lean and to God's holy will to plead. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears. Each with its clay I must fulfill life for itself or in his will. Only one life will soon be passed, but only what's done for Christ will last. Those, those four you know the the root of the of the of this poem is so plain cliche old school but it's truth and when you hear it and when i saw 
because what they did was they played a video of him sharing and he was preaching the gospel and he was saying these words and it was like he did his own funeral service but I wanted to get up and go serve God I said that's what we're supposed to do we're supposed to shine and make sure the things that are important are what's going to last God has called us to be used for his glory when we made that commitment to him we told him you're number one we have to live our life in that manner because there will be a day when we will stand before him what will be said about our life will others be able to look at our life and say they really cared about what was left I desire that. I know you desire that. Because we want to be tools in God's hand. He's given us the opportunity now, today, in this moment, to go forward and shine for him. Don't look back yesterday. Don't look back to last week or last month or last year and how you normally do things. Look forward to what God wants you to do. Be involved in things. Be a part of things. Be used place God first. We, we would have no idea how God would use that in our families and our friends. Praise God. Why don't we stand? I'm going to call the musicians forward. And I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. And we're going to pray. We're going to open the altar. And if there's anything that's come that's coming against you right now, even the heaviness of the day can be enough just to weigh us down and make us just want to run, just to get away from everything else. But God wants us to be used. He wants us to be made stronger in what we go through. And he wants to receive all the glory. So this morning as you bow your head, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for it is true, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have chosen us, Lord. We are unworthy. Father, we are unrighteous, but by your blood, we have been made righteous. And we ask you, even where we fall short, to help us, Lord. Father, when we are weary, we ask for your help, Lord. Father, help us to purpose in our heart to know the way will be difficult, but you will go before us. Help us not look to the easy way out, but to look, Father, to the path you have set for us, for your desire, for our lives, that, Father, we will see your mighty Holy Spirit move through us, Lord. Father, in these dark days, Lord, that we even read about, Lord, we want to see our family members saved. We want to see our loved ones saved. How can we see them saved when they don't see it in us, Lord? Help us to shine, Lord. To show them this truth. To live it, Lord. To show compassion, Lord. And Father, to be tools in your hand. We thank you for this time you've given us. And we ask you to continue to move in our hearts, Lord. <coughs> Minister to those who are at home, Lord. Those who are here in our midst, Lord. Father, we just ask you to fill each leader who's going to pray even right now for this people. In other words, you would have. We thank you. We trust in you. And Father, we wait, Lord, even for your call, Lord, with a godly excitement in our heart, knowing that you have a will for our life. Do your will in our lives this day. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.